Hi, I'm here with Osama, and we are really excited to share with you Southpaw and how it shaped our journey to improving the Microsoft Speed Services compute efficiency by five folds. I have been at this space at Microsoft for the last eight years. I'm really excited about speech recognition technologies and distributed systems. And I'm really looking forward to share with you more on the specifics later today. Thank you, Amr. Hi, Osama here. Also been at Microsoft for eight years, been working on speech and language systems, but I'm really enthusiastic about distributed systems and solving really challenging scalability problems. First, I want to tell you about speech in Microsoft. In Microsoft, we use speech in many different products. We use it in Microsoft Team, we use it in Xbox, and we use it in Microsoft Office as well. And speech is a compute-heavy service, meaning that it requires a lot of compute resources in terms of CPU and GPU in order to do its job. And it also has the different characteristics in that it has long-term requests. The requests are almost always in real time, meaning that when you stream audio, you want to get the results in real time with no delays. And that means every request ranged from a few hundred milliseconds into minutes and maybe sometimes hours if you're doing speech recognition for a live meeting, for example. And also in Microsoft, we have a different use case. We have something called custom speech, where we allow users to customize their speech models in any different way they want. And that means we have thousands of different models running at every single point in time. And that poses an interesting challenge to our services, as we'll see later on. Over the past few years, we've seen enormous growth in speech services. And today, we're running hundreds of Kubernetes services across 30 plus Azure regions in air-gapped and sovereign clouds. And every day, we allocate hundreds of thousands of CPUs and GPUs throughout the day as the demand grows, and we deallocate most of them as the demand shrinks. But speech services hasn't always been like that. We had a long journey of modernization in order to get to where we are today. I'll tell you more about it now. First, pre-2018, we were running on a static infrastructure, and everything was statically allocated. For example, we used to run on physical hosts statically allocated on the maximum possible demand that we will ever get. We were also running as a monolith application. We had a single application server that ran all the models and all the scenarios for all users. And obviously, progress was stunted because we can't light up new scenarios because something like custom speech that I told you about requires dynamic deployments and dynamic infrastructure, which we didn't have. And not to mention all the problems that came with monolithic infrastructure and also with static infrastructure where you have extreme inefficiencies. In 2018, we decided to switch to Kubernetes. And what we did was we migrated our workloads from Windows to Linux and then we decomposed our application server into front ends and back ends, simple client and server microservices. And because we didn't want to risk our users' experience, we still provisioned everything at max. All we did was that we switched to Kubernetes, and instead of using physical hosts, we used virtual machines. Users were happy, everyone was happy. The next step is we started deploying pod autoscaling. And pod autoscaling is where you start to scale the number of containers up and down based on the current demand that you have. And what we did was we tied the scaling to simple compute metrics, things like CPU and GPU workload. And we started to observe latency at the higher percentiles for very little number of users. And of course, that was not unacceptable. And at the time, all we did was simple solution, increase buffers for container reservation, and decrease scaling targets. We wanted to keep our users as happy as possible. Then we started to use virtual machine autoscaling. And that's when we deallocate virtual machines or compute nodes that we no longer need, and then reallocate them when we need them again. And that's when we started to see real cost savings. Our finance were really happy and because we started saving money, and our users were still happy because remember, we still had everything allocated at max. Then we took a closer look, and things were not as good as they thought they would be. If you take a look at this graph, this shows you one of our typical deployments as they allocate more compute resources over time. So if you look at the orange line, that's how many CPUs we're allocating. And the green line shows you how many of them we're actually using. So that gives you around 35% efficiency, which was not as good as we wanted, 
we wanted to do better. And remember, at our scale, with hundreds of thousands of CPUs allocated, with hundreds of thousands of pods running, every millicore counts. So we need to do something about that. That's when we started looking at optimizing our efficiency. Simple, easy. Decrease the resources that you've given to a container. Simple. And also what you could do is, you know, increase the scale target for your autoscaler and things will be fine. Of course they weren't. Because what happened was we started seeing a lot of container pressure. That's when a container started to use more than it had asked for. And that also meant on some nodes, you get complete CPU or GPU saturation more than you ever wanted. And that creates hotspots. And hotspots are very bad for a real-time service. So we started looking deeply into our metrics. And amongst other things, we realized that we have a serious load balancing problem. And Amr here will tell you more about it. Thanks, Osama. To illustrate the load balancing problem, let's conduct a little experiment mimicking a speech deployment. The set will be composed of 16 front-end pods talking to a service of 400 back-end pods via a four pods reverse proxy running the power of two choices load balancing algorithm. We will run 800 concurrent sessions mimicking a typical speech request duration of 5 to 60 seconds. Under uniform circumstances, each back-end pod should only get two requests at a time. This graph shows the per pod request distribution at the 50th, 90th, and 95th percentiles. At the 50th percentile, pods get anywhere from three to four requests, while at the higher percentiles, pods get up to seven requests. Note that anything below or above two requests is considered misbalanced. And the fact that some pods get up to seven requests means that some bots will actually get zero requests. Let's look at why this happens and why it can actually cause service degradations. Let's assume that each container has resources assigned for three concurrent sessions and one overcommitted for bursts. At one point of time, we send some requests and from each load balancer local view, the requests are evenly distributed across the four containers. Focusing only on load balancer to local view, its four ongoing sessions are evenly distributed. Now let's assume a new request arrives. Load Balancer 2 would pick a backend with least requests. In this particular case, it picked container 3, since from its perspective, the requests are still evenly distributed. Now switching back to the global view, container 3 has actually hit its overcommitted capacity and now is a potential hotspot. Under the right circumstances, container 2 can also hit the overcommit capacity due to load balancer to local view. This particular load balancing problem is not new. It is just a matter of target use case. Load balancers and load balancing algorithms are highly optimized for high throughput, short-lived, and high density endpoints where misbalancing errors are usually diluted. Our use case did not match the target use cases of the regular and traditional load balancers. Load balancers. Looking at a single pod from our previous experiment, the misbalancing is evident. This pod got only zero requests at times, while at other times it got up to seven requests and became a potential hotspot. And now that we have explained the problem, Osama will walk us through how we solved it. So we wanted to solve the load balancing problem because misbalancing is preventing us from optimizing the container resource reservation. Because when you think about it, you can either go too low or too high. So what are the alternatives? One thing we looked at is to set a limit on every container such that if the limit is reached in terms of number of requests, it will simply reject new requests and then would let the caller re keep retrying and hopefully it will land on a pod that is able to take the call. That didn't work very well for us because the retry loop kept on going for a while, especially when you have a spike in traffic. And that meant you have a growing backlog of audio accumulating. And then once you land on the right pod, you had to go through all this audio as fast as possible, which meant that you had you created resource pressure in that container, which meant we're back to square one. So that didn't work very, very well for us. We also considered using metrics to the load balancer such that the load balancer would have a better worldview so it can take better routing decisions. 
However, that didn't work very well in practice because by the time you can propagate the information in the metrics from the source all the way to the load balancer, the situation had already been changed and that didn't work for us as well. So it was clear for us that existing solutions did not work for our use case and we had to find a way around this. So in order to solve our load balancing problem, we started building Southpaw. And in order to understand how it works, let's take this simple example. Here we have a front end, think of it as the client, and we have two back end containers, think of them as the servers. Southpaw works as a sidecar, meaning that it runs alongside the main container. And you may have seen this pattern in service meshes such as Istio or Linkerd, because this allows us to easily inject it in, in the pods and it also allows us to service it independently from the main container. That also means that we can completely avoid using shared libraries. So Southpaw models workloads in terms of tokens. For example, the blue container has allocated resources that allows us to service four requests in parallel. That means the blue container issues four tokens telling everyone that it's able to do four different requests at the same time. Similarly, the orange container here. Now, every token has another attribute called a priority, and these are the little numbers that you see. And in Southpaw, priorities indicates an issuer's eagerness for a particular token to be used. Tokens with higher priority are used first, and token tokens with lower priority are, are used last. Then we have a distributed uh, priority queue. Every service has its own name priority queue. All the tokens issued from, issued from containers for that service are placed on that priority queue. Here we have the blue tokens and then we have the orange tokens. And because it's a priority queue, then tokens are always ordered according to their priorities. Now let's say a front end wants to make a call to one of the back ends. The first thing it do is that it calls its own Southpaw client. Then the Southpaw client will contact the distributed queue and then we'll pop a token for that service. And again, like we said, it will always pop, pop the token with the least priority. And then it will open this token, and inside that token, it will find the issuer's address or endpoint. And then it will use this endpoint to make a call to Southpaw server, which is on the issuer's side. And in that call, it's going to present the token it had obtained earlier. Then Southpaw server will check the token, will verify that it's valid, and then forwards the call to its backend. From this moment on, both Southpaw client and Southpaw server act like a completely transparent forwarding proxy. So let's say another request happens on this front end. Again, Southpaw client would pop a different token, again, following the same priority. And then inside that token, it will find the issuer's endpoint, makes a call to the endpoint, and so on and so forth. The process repeats popping tokens according to their priorities. And then until one of the requests is completed. So when the request is completed, Southpaw server issues a replacement token. Every token is used only once. However, the trick here is when the new token is issued, it is assigned a priority that is inversely proportional to the number of active requests on that particular pod. For example, because when this request was over, we had already running request, then it assigns it a priority of one. That means the next call that happens, it's going to take this token again. It'll use it to contact the issuer and so on. What you'll notice here is that because we assign priorities in inverse proportional uh, fashion to the number of concurrent requests on the pod at this po point, this means that these tokens will always be popped in breadth first. This means that we have a strong guarantee that we will always have uniform load balancing across the board. So now let's see how load balancing looks with Southpaw. From our earlier experiment, we can take a look at this graph. And on the left, you see how it used to look like with P2C load balancing. And on the right, it shows you what happened when we switched to Southpaw load balancing. And as you can see, when we did the switch, all requests were optimally serviced with two requests per pod. And that means we have extremely uniform load balancing. Now let's recap what Southpaw is doing for us. So now we have globally uniform call distribution. But also, if you've noticed, we have democratized traffic distribution. 
This means that containers are the one determining their own weight, their own load balancing weight, based on the local conditions. For example, a local condition could be like how much resource pressure there is around that time, or it could be something as simple as we use, which is the number of current requests. And that means we cut the middleman. We have extremely low latency decision-making process because containers are the ones at first hand knowing what's going on on their particular nodes. We also have switched to simple single dimension routing. And those of you who've worked with scalability before can really understand that. And sometimes we go into extremely complicated scenarios where we have multiple metrics used for scaling. But reducing them to a single dimension means a lot because you can easily reason about what's going on and how your cluster behaves. We also have a lightweight machinery, and that's an interesting point. Because everything is encapsulated in a priority queue, that means that service discovery and endpoint discovery is just a process of adding tokens. A service exists if it has a token, and a service doesn't exist if it doesn't have a token. Everything is encapsulated in a priority queue. No, no need to worry about extremely complicated state for that. And while we're at it, we added extremely extensive distributed tracing, as well as metrics and observability. We also threw in a PubSub API, such that external components can use that API to trigger external events. For example, you can use that to implement trigger-based scaling instead on a controller loop. You can also use it to dynamically create services on demand and destroy them when they're done. So by using Southpaw, we have significantly reduced the chances of causing any resource pressure, and we almost completely eliminated all possible hotspots through our speech service. You may be wondering about the overhead of all this. In our production clusters, we observe that call initiation latency is less than 5 milliseconds at the 99th percentile. And in our use cases, that's perfectly acceptable for two reasons. First, the advantage that we get from uniform load balancing is totally worth it. Second, the duration of our requests is much higher, and that means we can amortize any unique call initiation overhead. Also remember that once Southpaw client obtains the token, Southpaw client and Southpaw server all work in completely transparent proxy, meaning that we have minimal overhead and interference. And now I'm going to hand it over to Amr to tell you what, how far we can take this uh, beyond just load balancing. Thanks, Osama. So as we solved the load balancing problem, we needed to increase the speed and responsiveness of our scaling. So we utilized the tokens to switch from traditional compute metric scaling to discrete token scaling. This enabled us to maintain a constant number of idle tokens as opposed to a percentage of idle resources, which increases waste as deployment scales up. With token-based scaling, we increased the scaling metric propagation up to 80%, and we were also able to reduce overscaling by 30%. So we moved to solve our next problem, which is decreasing our spare unused capacity. To reduce spare capacity, and control its impact, we introduced priority multibanding. Multibanding is that more than one deployment can issue tokens to the same service queue. Each uses a separate band. Higher band deployments run on fully reserved capacity, while lower band deployments can run on opportunistic, transiently available, or overcommitted cluster resources. Lower bands are only used when higher bands are not available, or when there is high demand for high priority tokens and there is no more supply of the high priority tokens. This enabled us to do scenarios like no latency zero scaling. With priority multibanding, we were able to reduce the spare capacity by 50%. And now I'll hand it to Osama. Thanks, Amr. Here is one other thing that we use Southpaw for. It's something we call composite hierarchical services. What we wanted to do is to aggregate all the spare capacity of multiple services, where we can have a call that can target multiple services at the same time in a certain priority, such that the highest order service is used first. Otherwise, we try to block until one token available on any of the services. For example, a service can be a customized version of English speech recognition, 
And if the customized deployment at the higher priority service, EN customized one, is not available or doesn't have any tokens, then we can always fall back to the generic one. The advantage is if we have another customized service, then they both can share the fallback spare capacity. Not only that, normal English speech recognition requests can go to the generic service at the same time. This saved up to 48% of cluster spare capacity by doing this kind of aggregation. So to wrap up, let me show you the effect of all these innovation on one deployment that we shared at the beginning of the talk. If you remember at the beginning, this deployment had below 35% of compute efficiency. But now after applying all these innovations, we managed to raise the efficiency safely to 70% while keeping engineers happy and also finance got to save a bit of money. So in closing, Southpaw has been running all Microsoft production speech workloads for the past three years, and others are onboarding. In fact, it was so successful that we internally have some what we call Southstar Suite, which is a bunch of unified tooling around Southpaw token platform. And we're considering open sourcing Southpaw to help the community. So please share your opinions and your thoughts on it. We have our email and Slack. And thank you very much for listening and have a great day.